This program is brought to you by the partners of Arute Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support Arute Awakening International today. Well, tonight we're going to do something we have never done before. We're doing a Shabbat Night Live double feature. That's right, two episodes of Shabbat Night Live back to back. We are doing this to introduce a new series that explains exactly what faith in Yeshua is and what baptism really means. So get ready for the first two episodes of five episodes, back to back, of the doctrine of baptisms, because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. You know, in the Christian world, very little is known about baptism, truly, and what is known is filtered through a Greek mindset. And that's why we're doing a special two-episode series premiere of five episodes in total, and that's tonight, The Doctrine of Baptisms. That's right, two episodes, a double feature of Shabbat Night Live tonight, where Michael Rood is going to give you a clear and refreshing picture of what baptism really is and what it means and why it's done. Also, we trust you had a good time celebrating Purim earlier this week, as shown on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. We are now on the third Shabbat of the final month in the biblical calendar, and that means we have a new calendar right now available for pre-order. It will be sent out right after Passover, and you can pre-order yours now at arudawakening.tv slash calendar. So let's get into this double feature, started with a preview from the founder of A Rude Awakening International. Please welcome Michael Rude. Thanks, Scott, it's great to be here. Yes, sir. And uh, we had to pack this in. Uh, we've, this is five episodes. I wanted to get it in before Passover, because at Passover, uh, you know, we've got that picture of, uh, as Paul said, we were baptized in the Red Sea. Mm. You know, mixed multitude came out of Egypt, and when we went through the Red Sea, when we came out the other side to Mount Sinai, we were all Israel. So it didn't matter our bloodline, this was a mixed multitude in our mikvah, our baptism in the Red Sea. And as uh, Paul said in, in Hebrews, and I do believe that Paul wrote it because there's no one else who has a command of the scriptures as Paul does. Even though things are a little contorted in our English versions, yet it, it does uh, state this very specifically that, that the doctrine of baptisms is one of the foundations of the faith. And it has to be laid, that, that foundation has to be laid securely. And, and we've been uh, given baptism, you know, we, we've got all the, uh, the arguments whether you sprinkle, dunk, or dry clean. And, uh, and so I really wanted to do this series because this is the time, you know, as we get ready for uh, Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread leading up to uh, Shavuot or Pentecost, it's really the time uh, of house cleaning. And uh, you know, as we do for Passover, get rid of all the leaven, get it all out. So I felt this is the time to get the leaven out, get the stuff out there in front of the people. So. That's why the double feature tonight. Interesting, and, and we are doing that so that we get uh, all five, like you said, before Passover. Uh, so this will be interesting. After this episode, we will come back and we will actually uh, talk about that first episode and talk about the next one. So uh, stay tuned for that if you're watching right now. There Stay tuned, we're just gonna have them literally back to back, and Michael and I will come back again after the first episode. Uh, but So when you mentioned that the, the Israelites went through the Red Sea, so was that, is that one of these instances where uh, Yehovah had what happened to the Israelites serve as a prophecy for, for the future? Uh, well, uh, Paul literally says that uh, they were baptized in the cloud mm. and in the Red Sea. So it okay. was the cloud, the baptism of the Spirit and the baptism in the Red Sea. You know, it's that, that double shadow picture right there. So uh, as Yeshua uh, said, as he was instructing his disciples before his ascension, he said, go into the whole world, make disciples, teach them what I taught you, and baptize them in my name. And so uh, it says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not 
is not going to be saved. So, you know, that, that's a real, well, that, that's, uh, that's saying a little bit more than what I wanna hear if I'm just a, a you know, a Sunday go to meeting uh, Christian or if I haven't been baptized yet. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that doesn't believe, and that word believe, when we, we see the context of the Gospels, uh, this is the prophet, the words of the prophet we must shema. We are required to hear and obey. So if we hear and obey him, we will be baptized. If we don't believe him, if we don't hear and obey, then we won't be saved. And that, that saved is sozo in Greek. It, it's wholeness. It's not, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, the, 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 you do this prayer and then you're gonna go to heaven. That's what they, they mean by saved. That's not the biblical definition at all. There's no, no uh, protocol of repeating after me and doing this prayer and then you get to go to heaven. You know, that, that whole thing is, is like, you know, th this is an invention of the Gentiles. It, it's the Messiah is going to come to the earth, he is going to reign upon the earth. We are going to reign as priests and kings with him if we do the job he's asked us to do. This is the message of the Gospels, this is how we enter into the kingdom, and so we're gonna be clarifying a lot of these things as we go through the doctrine of baptisms. Wow, very, very, very powerful. So, it, it, so basically, infant baptism, I mean, this is, exactly why this is not a thing. I mean, you can't believe and then be baptized if you're an infant. No, no, no this is a, a pagan, whole pagan concept. See, baptism, the word baptism is a, an English transliteration of a Greek word, baptizo. And baptizo uh, is part of the pagan culture. Uh, I'm going to explain in the series that uh, those who take a boat trip, a cruise, and they go up above the Arctic Circle, when they go above the Arctic Circle, then there is a baptism ceremony that goes on. This is not a Christian baptism ceremony. This is a pagan baptism ceremony where they dunk them in water, they immerse them uh, in water on the ship as they cross the, the line, and uh, this is an initiation. Hmm. Uh, it used to be that sailors uh, uh, in the United States Navy and the Marines, when they would go uh, below the equator, they would get an earring. They'd get the ear pierced and would get an earring. So that's kind of a, a pagan baptism or tradition uh, for, uh, for that particular milestone. The, the milestone that Yeshua is talking about is that we are identifying with him, and that's what we're going to uh, explore in this series, and that's why it's so important to do it this, this time of year. Now, isn't, isn't there a difference between, I mean, it was done in the Jordan River, and it has to do with, isn't it have to do with washing away the sins? Is, is, is running water the way it's supposed that, to be done? That's right. The uh, baptism really comes from mikvah. Mikvah literally means running water, and it is complete immersion in running water. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that the water washes over you and carries the pass away. And we're going to explore the different, the type of, of baptisms that are described in the New Testament. You know, the baptism of purification, the baptism of identification, the baptism of suffering. You know, that, that's another one that, that, that the believers need to understand that when they identify with Yeshua, when they follow him and on what he says to do first, then as we continue to follow him, there's gonna be suffering that happens. There, there's gonna be uh, some things in life that, that go away. There's gonna be a baptism of fire that, that the, the things that used to be important to us are going to be burned away. And we have to understand that that's what's going to happen. Hmm. You know, when we say you are Lord, that means he is Lord. Right. That means he has full reign to do what he wants to do in our life, and we, we, we need to yield to him in that way. You know, there are some things we don't yield. Uh, you know, we, we do the commandments. We keep the Torah. It's, yeah, that's our responsibility. But there are some things that we yield in, and it's not my will, but yours be done. Got it, okay, very interesting. Can't wait for the series now. Thank you, Michael. So what is baptism really, and why is it so foundational to understanding what being a believer really means? Well, stay tuned for the first of two episodes back-to-back -to -back tonight. It's the series premiere of The Doctrine of Baptisms, and after this episode is finished, uh, stay right where you are. Michael and I will be back to tell you more about episode so two, until then, get ready to celebrate the Kiddush with Michael, coming up next.
One of the most famous stories in the Bible is that of the Apostle Paul being shipwrecked. Though it seemed all was lost, the Almighty stepped in and saved every person on board. In his new teaching, Shipwrecked, Michael Rood reveals this event as a metaphor for our journey in life and for our responsibility as believers to rescue those drowning in hopelessness. It is a picture of the journey in life. We are on a ship. You are on a ship. You are on the ship. And there are so many people around who are drowning. Shipwrecked is the final teaching in Michael Rood's epic love gift series on the Book of Acts. But it's not for sale, and you won't see it on YouTube. The only way you can get it is to accept it as our gift to say thank you for your donation to A Rood Awakening International. You'll get this exclusive teaching for your love gift donation of just $50. Or with a donation of $100 or more, you'll receive the teaching, plus a family-friendly card game featuring the spring and fall feasts of the Lord and a silver-plated seven-branch menorah with symbols of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Or for a gift of $300 or more, you'll receive the teaching, the Feasts of the Lord card game, the 12 tribes menorah, and a breathtaking silver-plated Kiddush fountain. Decorated with scenes from ancient Jerusalem, this eight-cup fountain is an elegant way to set the Sabbath apart each week. These gifts are available only in March. You'll get the shipwreck teaching for a love gift donation of $50, the Teaching, the Feasts of the Lord card game, and the 12 Tribes Menorah for a love gift of $100 or more. Or get everything plus the Elegant Kiddush Fountain for a love gift donation of $300 or more. Act now. Supplies are limited. Call 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or visit monthlylovegift.com. The night of the Last Supper, Yeshua took our tone, our tone, leavened bread, and he blessed the Most High, and he broke the bread and said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. He took the cup, and he blessed the Most High, and said, this represents the renewed covenant in my blood. The following day, the following day, on the 14th of the month of the Aviv, there were two large loaves on the wall of the temple. And when they took the first loaf down, after that, no more bread, no more leavened bread was eaten. Then when they took the second loaf down, that's when all of the leavened bread in the city of Jerusalem and everywhere else was completely expunged. It was burnt in the fire. That was the rehearsal that was done the following day, just before the Passover lambs were sacrificed in preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But Yeshua represents in this very thing in the breaking of the bread that we do, in the Kiddush, in the sanctification, every Shabbat, we remember that his body was broken for us. By his stripes, we were healed. And in the taking of this cup, as we say this prayer in thanksgiving to Almighty God, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaLam, Borei Pri Hagafen. Yeshua said this, is the renewed covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Every meal, any time, any Sabbath, any feast, any time that you need to remember his broken body and shed blood, we do this in remembrance of him. Yeshua's last commandment to his apostles, his last words before instructing them to go into the city of Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit that would come on the day of Shavuot or Pentecost, these last words, Yeshua's famous last words, are found in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Yeshua commanded his apostles, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel the good news to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. 
Those words seem to be rather harsh, and to understand what it means by those who believe not shall be damned, we need to understand what the gospel is, what the good news is, because the good news is tied up in the prophecy that Moses spoke, that the Almighty was going to send another prophet, like unto Moses, one who hears directly from the throne room in heaven. And those who do not hear and obey, do not shema that prophet, they will be judged. Peter on the day of Pentecost went on to say that, that quoting that very same verse, it says that he that does not shema, he does not, who does not hear and obey shall be destroyed. So that is what the meaning of this, this, this harsh words those that believe not shall be damned because damned is literally judged. They will be judged. And this is exactly what the prophecy of Moses is. The good news is that the prophet that was promised by Moses has come into the world. And that gospel of the kingdom, that gospel has to be preached to every creature. And then Yeshua said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believes not shall be damned. Believe is a verb. A verb connotes action. The action that is demanded is baptism. That's what Yeshua said. Failure to act or to comply results in judgment. Baptism is the foundational commandment for those who desire to be grafted into Israel and enter into the renewed covenant and its promises. Those who remain outside of the fence of this instruction remained under a curse regardless of the religion that they've concocted in their fertile imagination. See, the word believe, this is the same word that is also translated as faith. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. We speak of the faith of Abraham. Abraham had faith, but this faith is action. It is a verb. It is sometimes translated as faithing in the modern parlance because it's faithing, it's believing. There is action. As James said that faith without works is dead. Believing without action is is dead. There's nothing to it. You say you believe God, he goes on to say, the devil believes in God, what's the big deal there? He just isn't obedient. He doesn't do what the Almighty says to do. He is outside of that instruction. So Yeshua says, those who believe and are baptized, they are the ones that will be saved. Those who believe not, don't take the action, do not continue in obedience of what Yeshua said to do, they are outside the fence. And why I use that term is that the rabbis of Israel, they depicted the Torah as the fence around God's people. The fence, everyone is supposed to be inside the fence. And those who are outside of the fence, outside of the commandments, outside of the constraints of the Almighty are under a curse. This is what Moses said. Now, Paul, who is also quoting right straight from Moses, says all those who are ek, outside of the Torah, are under a curse. And so the rabbis said, well, in order to ensure that people do not break the fence, that they do not break the commandments of God, that we we are going to construct another fence outside of the fence, another set of rules and regulations so that if they don't break the rules and regulations that we set up, then they won't even come close to breaking the fence that God set up, won't come close to breaking the commandments of God. However, The commandments of God specifically state in the foundation of the instructions that we are given from Moses is that no one, no one is ever allowed to add one single commandment to the commandments we receive from Moses on Mount Sinai. No one is ever allowed to diminish one single commandment. 
that we may keep all the commandments of Yehovah our God. If someone disobeys, if someone breaks the commandments of God, they are then under a curse. But what did the rabbis do? The rabbis constructed not a fence around the fence, they literally broke an opening in the fence that says you will not add and you will not subtract. They broke that down and they made a separate corral of doctrines and commandments, dogmas as it says in the Greek, the doctrines and commandments of men that they have broken the fence down, they have herded the believers inside of their fence and that fence is outside of the Torah. They are under a curse, who, those who are within the boundaries of the religious system, be it Phariseeism, be it Christian doctrines and dogmas, which have added and subtracted, all those who are outside of the fence, they are under a curse. And so those who remain outside of the fence of Yeshua's instructions, the prophet that we must hear and obey They are under a curse. And this is why we are seeing so much defeat, so much lack of power within the Christian world, within the Messianic world, because people have not taken Yeshua's words seriously. They like the sweet baby Jesus story. They like to talk about the Torah, but they don't like to talk about what Yeshua said to do and what he commanded. In my heart's desire is that I deliver you from being outside of the fence, that I help you to understand what this commandment means. Because he that believes and is baptized will be made whole, will be saved. But those who do not act on what Yeshua says to do, they remain outside of the fence, outside of the promises, And regardless of the religion that we have established, we will never live with the power and the authority that we were ordained to live. Because we are, as the scripture says, the covenant has been renewed and we are priests and kings. But unless we act on it, unless we move on it, we will not be empowered to live an abundant life, a life in which we grow up in the fullness and stature of Messiah. We will be outside looking in. We will remain outside, unwillingly outside, and looking in through a darkened window because we haven't obeyed the simplest and the primary commandment. He said, go into the whole world, preach the good news, make disciples, Teach them what I taught you. It's no wonder that Yeshua's apostles took Yeshua's instructions so seriously. Every one of them died attempting with their whole heart to fulfill those instructions to the letters. But Yeshua's words are ignored by the Christian world today in deference to the easy believism and seeker-friendly greasy grace of modern churchianity. Well, I want to take you into the understanding of baptism, what it's all about. And so I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter six. And when I give you these references, I want you to go back and I want you to read the chapters before and after to get the entire context because I'm gonna take you into the Bible from Genesis to Revelation because that's what it takes to understand these things. I have, been, I have been working on these things my whole life, memorizing scripture, reading the scriptures over and over and over, never a daily devotional, but literally reading chapters. And in preparation for this, this is a, a most serious topic. When Yeshua says, those who believe and are baptized, shall be saved, but those who do not act, who do not believe, do not have faith, do not move, do not hear and obey the words of the prophet, they will be judged. 
This is most serious, and only those who really are in him are really going to hear this. In Hebrews chapter six, verse one, it says, leaving the principles, the, the first, the foundational, the primary issues concerning the doctrine of Messiah, let us go on to perfection. Let us go on to maturity. Let's go on to adult matters. Let's leave behind the, the basics, okay? The, the milk of the word. Then let's move on to adult matters. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and the foundation of faith toward God and of the doctrine of baptisms. See, this is considered one of the foundations, one of the primary things, the doctrine of baptisms, plural. And goes on, the foundations of the laying out of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do. We will move on to the meat of the world. We'll, we're going to move on to perfection, move on to, per, for, to maturity, if God permits. Now, if God permits, this is really dependent upon the hearer. If the hearer will hear and obey, then more will be given and we will be able to go on to perfection. We'll be able to go on to the deeper matters, and this is what my goal is. This is what my heart's desire is, is that I can communicate these things to you. But if you will not hear and obey, this is going to fall on dead ears, and Yeshua is going to be declaring this very thing in Matthew as we go into this. The doctrine of baptisms is a foundational doctrine but it has been twisted. It's been commandeered by religion. Martin Luther, as a Roman Catholic priest, drowned. He murdered more than 300 Anabaptists to reinforce infant baptisms as part of his Protestant Reformation. He was a murderer in the name of religion. So we need to understand baptism the doctrine of baptisms. Now, first of all, baptism is an English word, but it's a transliteration of the Greek word baptizo, which comes laden with pagan practices. And so, first of all, we have to define what baptism is not, because it's not a pagan ceremony that is done aboard ship when one crosses the Arctic Circle even though that is what is done today. It is a pagan ceremony. They call it a baptism, but that's nothing new because this is what was done in Greek temples. This is what was done in the temple of Aphrodite and in Zeus and Easter. It is a pagan ceremony, baptizo. But we are going to go into what it means, not as a Greek word and a Greek concept, but what it is in the Hebrew world, what it is in according to the commandments of God. Baptism is not a membership and is a secret skull and bone society. It's not a Masonic or Mormon indoctrination ritual. Baptism is not allegiance to a satanic cult or a Christian denomination. Baptism is not an entrance ritual into a church social club, or as some put it, a poor man's country club. Baptism is not something you do in case this whole God thing turns out to be reality. Baptism is not a once in a lifetime event, as hopefully a bath is not. Several years ago, I was blessed with the opportunity of being the official baptizer at Kibbutz Kinneret. Kibbutz Kinneret is a, an Orthodox community right down at the base of the hill where I lived, right down below Alamot Junction, right on the Jordan River as it, it egresses from the Sea of Galilee. That is the place that has been set aside and the Orthodox have built this as a baptismal site. Now, this is not an Orthodox baptismal site, it's a Christian baptismal site. But who owns it? 
who runs it, it's the Orthodox. And so many years ago, they asked if I would be willing to be the official baptizer, the one that they would call on as some people would come to this baptismal site, they would want to be baptized, but they didn't have a pastor, they didn't have anyone to do it, and of course, the Orthodox are not equipped to do this, and so uh, for years, there was a, a man who was the official baptizer there, but then he retired. He moved away, and so they asked if I would be the official one that they called to do the baptism. So my office was right up on top of the hill, right at Alamote Junction, and they would call me and it would take me really less than 10 minutes to be able to get down to the site. So it was it was perfect. And to do it, I wanted to really give these people a, a taste of what it's all about. These Christians who are coming in from around the world, they come to this site, so I would dress in my biblical garments, my begotivry, that's what I, I'm, I'm dressed in now. And even though uh, this was, was something that, that was not required, I, I wanted to make this a memorable experience for these people because I understand how important this is. When Yeshua says, you must, you must be baptized. And those who be- don't believe, they're gonna be judged. Those who do not act on this simple commandment. So I was more than willing to do this. So. I would get dressed in my begotivry, I would go down to the Canaret, and I would meet with the, with the group of people there, and I would start out. And I would say, John the Baptist, his name wasn't John, and he was not a Baptist. John, his real name was, was Yohanan. Yohanan ben Zachariah HaKohen. Yohanan was the son of Zechariah. Zechariah was an Aaronic priest. He was the son of Aaron. As his mother, Elisheva, was a daughter of Aaron. This is the priest class. It was the high priest class. And Yohanan knew exactly what he was doing. Yohanan wasn't doing anything unusual. He was not baptizing. He was immersing in a mikvah, and to understand what he was doing and what I was doing and explaining this to people, the the people that that heard and understood it, even the Orthodox, they were so thrilled by what I was doing and explaining, they actually filled me and made that an official DVD that people could get when they came down there to to understand what it was because I was giving the background on this because John was a priest, a priest of Israel. He was called by the Almighty to call the people to repentance. And when they repented and and showed a, a true repentance, at that point, when they said that that they had repented, then they were immersed in a mikvah, which means running water. Mikvah literally means running water. And it is complete immersion, complete immersion in running water. This is going to take care of all the confusion, whether baptism is sprinkled, dunked, or dry cleaned, because the mikvah is running water. And there was a mikvah in every community in Israel. There were hundreds of mikvah on the Temple Mount. Before you go into the the temple, before you came into the area of the tabernacle, you had to complete this ritual washing. But it's more than a ritual. It's a picture of complete immersion in running water. The water runs over you, flows over you, and your past in your uncleanness is taken care of. Your sin is carried away as far as the east is from the west. It's never coming back. It is literally a death, a burial, and a resurrection. And even among the Orthodox, the Bavavichers will say when a person comes out of the mikvah, they will shout, born again because that is the picture, is that your past is gone, it's dead, it's done away with, 
and now we walk in a new life. In Mark 16, 15, when Yeshua said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes, believing again is action. He that believes will take the action of immersion, immersion. So we're gonna take it out of the category of baptized, but immersed, immersed shall be saved. Immersed in a mikvah shall be saved. But he that believes not shall be judged. In Exodus 19, verse nine, this is where the foundation of he that believes, believes the gospel will be saved. In Exodus 19, verse nine, Yehovah said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud that the people may shema, they may hear and obey when I speak with you. And what happened on that day when the Almighty came down on that mountain and called out to Moses, Moses, come up here. And Moses walked up into that blast furnace. That day when he came to him in that thick cloud and called out his name and Moses walked up into that flaming furnace of that mountain, the people hear, heard, and obeyed. And that is why he said, I will do this so that when you speak, the people will shema. They hear, will hear and obey you and believe in you forever. Literally in the Hebrew it says, they will believe in Moses forever because of this power and display. And then to understand and believe what Moses said in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, the Almighty said to Moses, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto you, Moses. I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not shema, will not hear and obey my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Now, those words are a little, little hard in King James, but whoever will not shema my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require him, that prophet, to judge them for their refusal to hear and obey my words, which he shall speak. Now we understand why those who refuse to hear and obey they will be judged because this is the prophet of whom Moses prophesied. This is the prophet that the Almighty promised and this is the prophet that Yeshua is. The prophet we must hear and obey. Yeshua said to go out and make disciples of every nation and teach them what I taught you. This is the commandment of Yeshua. He said to Nicodemus, and this is familiar to all those who have watched football games where the reference John 3.16 comes up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Whosoever believeth in him, what does it mean to believe in him? It means to hear and obey him. Those who believe in him, that he is the prophet of whom Moses spoke. The prophet that will judge those who do not hear and obey him. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever does believes to hear and obey him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul, in his letter to the Romans in chapter 10, verse nine, says this is the word of faith that we preach. This is the word of believing action that we preach. That if thou shalt confess, and this is a continual, 
a continual confession. It's not a one-time action in the past. It's not a, when, with every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, just come, raise your hand, now come forward and repeat after me this prayer and then you're saved. You're going to heaven. No, if you continue to confess your whole life, the Lord Yeshua, it doesn't, you don't confess him as a fire escape from hell. You don't accept, uh, accept him as your savior. You confess that he is Lord. That means you do what he says to do. Believing is action. If you confess with your mouth the Lord, Yeshua, that he is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the, from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be saved is one word in Greek, sozothane. If you believe in your heart, God has raised Yeshua from the dead, sozothane. Thou shalt in the future be saved. You're not saved when you say the words. No, you shall be saved when the captain of our salvation returns and saves us, saves our rotted bodies from the grave, the, the mortal it puts on immortality at that moment when we are born again into a body that can be raptured, that can be harpazoed, that can be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, to be gathered together on the sea of fire and glass, and then to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then return to live and reign with him on the earth for a thousand years. At that point, when the captain of our salvation returns, that's when we are saved. That's when we are born again, biblically speaking. Not in the modern Christian parlance. No, the modern Christian parlance is dead wrong. It's a false hope. A false hope that all you have to do is get somebody to say this, this little prayer, just before they die and everything's fine. They're gonna go to heaven. They're gonna sprout wings. They're gonna sit on a cloud and play a harp and smoke cigars for eternity. This is the word of faith. This is the word of believing. You confess him as Lord. That means you do what he says to do. And when Yeshua says, he that believes and is baptized, immersed, shall be saved. That takes action. Now, I know there's those of the greasy grace enclave who, want, who will say, and I've heard it said on Christian television, it said, if God judges anyone who says this repeat after me prayer, then God is unrighteous because God can only look upon you and see the, the righteousness of Jesus. Well, somebody forgot to tell Jesus about that because those who do not hear and obey him, they have to be judged by him. And that's exactly what the scriptures say. The book of the Revelation, Yeshua just is not in tune with this. He says to the church in Ephesus, you get these things together. You've done some things good but you still have some things to take care of. And if you take care of them, then there is going to be a reward. To others, he said, you have got these things wrong with you, and if you don't take care of them, I am going to throw you in a bed with that whore Jezebel, and I'm going to burn you. It doesn't sound like this is sweet baby Jesus. No, this is Yeshua with fire in his eyes, whose hair is shocking white, blowing in the wind, whose voice is like a thousand oceans roaring, whose words cut like a sword, and John falls down like a dead man at his feet. Yeah. In Matthew Chapter 13, verse 10. You need to go there. You need to read this. The apostles asked Yeshua, why do you speak to the multitude in parables? And Yeshua answered, because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it is not given. For whosoever hath Whosoever hath, that word hath is 
echo, kateko, whoever holds fast, guards, hears and obeys my words, to him shall be given, and he shall have even more abundance. Those who hear and obey my words, those who guard and protect them and hold fast and hear and obey, more truth will be given. He will be given more in abundance. But whosoever hath not, whosoever does not hear and obey, he who does not guard and hold fast to my commandments, my words that I speak, from him shall be taken away even that which he hath. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the greatest threat in the entirety of scriptures. And it is also the most precious promise. Those who hear and obey, and those apostles who were hearing and obeying, more was given. And Yeshua would not even speak to the multitudes, the people outside. They didn't understand, and he said, I don't want them to understand, because they will not even hear and obey. They will not hear and obey And those who do, even more truth will be given. But those who do not hear and obey the truth they have, even the truth they have will be taken away from them. This is a threat because this is a path that we're on in life, ladies and gentlemen. We have not reached the end. We have not attained. We have not, we have not reached the pinnacle. We are not mature. We have not reached the fullness and stature of Messiah. We are on a path. The, the opening to the path is extremely narrow. Very, very few people will ever find the gate that leads to life. And even fewer will walk it because it keeps on getting narrower all the time. Those who do not hear and obey, even that truth which they think they have, even that truth that they had when they entered the gate, even that will be taken away from them. This is why it behooves us to be obedient to everything that Yeshua says. And the first, the primary thing that he says is to immerse, to immerse in the mikvah. And this is why at Passover every year, we mikvah, we immerse hundreds of people who come understanding what it's all about. And that is why we are interrupting what we're doing for this teaching because you need to understand it, and then we go on from there. So the doctrine of baptisms. We are going to cover all the baptisms in the Brit Hadashah, the renewing of the covenant. Now, in the New Testament, as some people call it, we have the baptism of repentance. We also have the baptism of purification, which includes separation and division. We have the baptism of identification. We have the baptism of suffering, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the hope of the resurrection, the baptism of fire, and then I'm going to give you some bonus baptisms, the baptism of disobedience. And finally, those who stay with us to the end, the baptism for the dead. All of these baptisms we are going to cover in this series. We're going to begin with the baptism of purification. And we go to John chapter 11, verse 55. It says, the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. This is a little ridiculous, the Jews' Passover. It was Passover. Of course, this is the Greek version, so uh, the the Greek version of John is going to have to qualify it. It's the Jews' Passover. No, this is Yehovah's Passover. It is Israel's Passover. It is Passover. It was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before Passover to purify themselves. Now, what is this to purify themselves? This is the baptism or the the mikvah or the immersion of purification. 
And we read about this first in Exodus chapter 19, verse 10, in which Yehovah said to Moses, go down to the people and instruct them to purify themselves, to immerse themselves, to purify themselves, and to wash their clothes. Purify themselves and wash their clothes today and tomorrow and be ready before the third day. For on the third day, Yehovah will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. This purification is something that is done and everyone understands this. John the Baptist, Yohanan ben Zechariah, was doing exactly what all Israel understood. Everyone was intimately familiar with the immersion, but he was doing it completely outside of the religious enclave. Every community, every synagogue, the temple, there were hundreds of mikvahot all over the land of Israel. But yet he was not in cahoots with the religious system. He was out in the wilderness, he was calling people to repent, come out of Babylon, come out of the religious system, which has added commandments, have taken away commandments, and they have polluted the word of God, they have destroyed the purity of the word of God, they've added, they've subtracted, come out and repent. This is the foundational commandment upon which John the Baptist, Yohanan ben Zachariah's ministry is based, calling the people to repent, come back to the Torah. You don't add, you don't subtract, come back. And so he was calling them to repent and immerse. And when they did that, they were on fire. They went back to their communities and turned their synagogues. They were turning the, the Jerusalem upside down to where they had to send Levites and Kohanim from the Pharisee-controlled Sanhedrin to find out who are you, why are you doing this? You're turning this our whole world upside down. Are you the Messiah? Are you the prophet of whom Moses spoke? Are you Elijah? Who are you? The immersion, the purification of which every Israelite was familiar in going up to Jerusalem is to purify themselves, to separate themselves from their contact with the world. The, where the unclean and the defiled are separated from their state of personal uncleanness. This goes for men and women. It goes for both with, with their, their physical bodies, which happens in natural state of, of life and intercourse. That is what renders a person in a state of uncleanness to where they must go into the mikvah and purify themselves before they can come into the presence of a holy God. And that is exactly what the purification was spoken of in Exodus. The people mikvahed, they immersed themselves and they washed their clothes to get ready to come into the presence of a holy and a righteous God. If you come in contact with dead bodies, blood, disease, leprosy, all these things required that you mikvah, you immerse before approaching the mountain of God, the tabernacle and the temple. This is the preparation before entering into the presence of the Holy One. Now we see this separation in Matthew chapter three, verse one. It says that John the Baptist, Yohanan ben Zechariah came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent from what? You had to read the Torah, you had to read the prophets because he just didn't say repent. No, he is out there preaching. He's calling people and he's laying it on the line. So, so juvenile is our reading of the scriptures when, when we read the words repent and we do not relate it to everything that Moses taught, everything that he commanded, and all that the prophets said to bring us back to what Moses said. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him 
and were baptized, immersed by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Shalom, Torah fans. Since you love the truth, give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.